My job, well, is that I keep people in cages. Yes, I know it's inhumane. No, I don't care for your opinion on it. There's a reason I do what I do. The people are all of ordinary appearance. Some are fat, some skinny. Some have blonde hair, others are brunettes. If it were up to me, I would let the people go. But I can't. They all did something, and now they're in the cages. The cages aren't cramped or anything. They're each about 5x5x5. Five by five by five. There are 7 cages in total. Each one holds a different person from a different background. Every 3 days, one gets taken away and another is wheeled in. Never a member of the opposite sex either. If a man was in the cage, he'll be replaced by a man. Same for women. I don't know their names, but it's not my job to. I'm paid to feed them and watch them. I have given the cages names, which is then passed on to their occupants. Cage 1 is Fred. Usually Fred's occupants are between 5'7 and 5'10. They always have brown hair, but styles and length vary, as does their weight. They are to be given 14 ounces of AB positive blood once every 7 hours. No mirrors within 30 feet of their cage. Cage 2 is Cassie. All the Cassies have been 5'4 or 5'6, never 5'5. They're always blonde, smaller women. Petite, one might say. They're to be given exactly 40 fluid ounces of water and a pound of raw meat daily. Cassie's cage is electrified unless she's being fed. Cage 3 is Earl. Earl always is a scruffy looking dude with a handlebar mustache. Hair doesn't matter, nor does color. His rules are simple. One jar of mustache wax and a copy of the times. However, the copy must always be not from within the previous year. He is also not to be given hair tonic for any reason. Cage 4 is Mary. Mary is always a religious type, which religion varies. So far as I can tell, we've had three Muslims, five Christians, five pagans, and two Hindu Marys. They're almost always 5'3 and have varied in weight. No set rules, so I just give them whatever I have available as food. Well, except one. They're not allowed any access to holy or religious imagery, no matter what. Cage 5 is Chad. Chad is always a blonde guy, usually clean cut with clothes that indicate a high social status. Designer clothes and the like. I don't much care for Chad. He's to be given a cup of green liquid. The liquid never kills them. It doesn't even make them sick. Chads don't talk much. Mainly because when he does, a black ooze comes out of every hole in his face. It's freaky at first, but you get used to it. Cage 6 is Bob. Bob is interesting, mainly because I can't tell what each person has in common. So far, we've had all males, but they've consisted of 7 African Americans, 14 Caucasians, 8 Asians, and 13 mixed races. They've been everything from plumbers to bankers, and even homeless. Oh well, the mystery goes on. No set rules in place. They do require cleanup though. On day two, their eyes are always missing, replaced with oddly enough, two coins. They never seem to be in pain, however, even making idle chat with me. And finally, Cage 7 has only ever had one occupant. She's never been taken away. She's a six year old girl named Lisa. 
She has a blue dress, blonde hair and pigtails, and an ever-present smile. And the weird part, she's been here for at least a decade, hasn't aged a day. All she ever does is sit in her cage. She's given coloring books and 30 minutes of TV time daily. Again, I don't make the rules. All I know is that these people all did something. Something the higher ups won't tell me. And so now we have the cages. The very unique and specifically made cages. I found this job through, of all things, Craigslist. The previous guard, whose name was not disclosed, left instructions for the feeding, maintenance, etc. of the people. He listed their many quirks and how to handle each situation as it may arise. I was weirded out, but you get used to it, you know. That was 2010, and here we are now. 2020 and I'm still watching people in cages. The previous guy told me that they used to be simple beds, which each of the various characters strapped to them. All of them except for Lisa. And Lisa was always given a small feather bed, and while she was strapped in, she was always tucked into a blanket like one would do a child. My boss, or at least the guy who tells me my job, is an older guy. His left hand is kind of messed up. He said it was a cooking accident. Hot grease, as it were. He could pass for an aging moving star, in all honesty. Salt and pepper hair with a voice like a knife through butter. Something is a little off about him, though. I swear, I never remember his face correctly. It always looks different than I remember. Anyway, my boss, who goes by TD, told me the previous guy held this post for 30 years. The pay is good, don't get me wrong, but 30 years? It's a bit long. My first day on the job, I was shown the cages and explained what would be happening with the people. All I'm allowed to know is that they did something really bad, and so now they're locked away for three days. The beds were revoked for a reason that someone never made clear. Something about teeth and a missing ear. Anyway. For ten years, it's remained this way. Every three days, someone leaves and someone enters. All except for Lisa. Every new person gets the same treatment as the one they replace. What worries me is what happened yesterday. They added an eighth cage. The installation of the eighth cage wrapped up yesterday, and today they brought in the first occupant. They brought in an old man. He wasn't even able to stand. They had to wheel him in as he was wheelchair bound. I couldn't imagine why they would feel the need to lock him away. He wore an old respirator over his face, connected to an oxygen tank on his back. He looked about 90 and fit comfortably into his cage. I heard his ribs rattle with every breath as the door was locked shut. Instructions for care, as directed by TD, were one live rodent, up to 5 pounds in weight. This was to be fed to him once per day. I think I'll call this one Bill for now. It seems fitting somehow. Today, they took another of the Freds away. Two hours later, he was replaced by a different man, but ticking the usual boxes. 5'8", brown hair, the usual. This Fred was morbidly obese, at least 400 or so pounds. Mary was saying her usual prayers and Lisa was coloring. A quiet day on the job as they usually were. That was until feeding time. No surprises, until I got to Bill. The old man didn't even seem aware of his surroundings, if I'm being honest. He looked to be on death's door. Truthfully, I wondered what anyone in his state could have done. I tossed in a large rat, still squirming. He caught it quickly. 
He lifted off his oxygen mask just enough to expose his mouth, and he unhinged his freaking jaw like a snake. He ate it whole, bones and all. I jumped back a bit, startled by the sudden motion from the seemingly weak old man. I moved on to Bob. Bob's eyes were replaced today. Oh, by the way, I feel I should mention, the coins aren't the same kind of coins every time. They've been everything from American coins to Greek drachmas. Anyway, the cleanup comes in with cleaning up the blood from the replacement. Yeah, it's not as clean as I may have implied. They aren't just in a socket. They're stitched there. There's usually quite a bit of blood. This particular Bob is an investment banker, so he claims from Manhattan. He's a middle-aged guy, about 35 if I had to guess. This time, his eyes were a pair of 50 cent pieces. The JFK ones if I had to guess. Grabbing a mop and a bucket of water, and a stun gun for Bob, I got to work. The cleanup process usually takes about 25 to 30 minutes. Next was bringing Lisa her television for her allotted 30 minutes. She always preferred to watch movies, like Cannibal Holocaust or The Human Centipede. Her favorite movie is a Serbian film. And for the TV, well, it was like one of those ones you would see at school. On a wheeled table, strapped down. You know what I mean. She had a doll that I hadn't seen with her before. She usually had a teddy bear, as was part of her instructions for care. I didn't think it was important, so I didn't mention it. But this doll was new. The doll had two hollow sockets for eyes, and chunks of black hair stapled to its head. It wore a blue dress, similar to Lisa's. In place of hands, it had what appeared to be the paws of cats. It stood about two feet tall. His face had a perpetual grin. Again, not unlike the young girl to whom it was in possession of. I made a note to inform the higher-ups and I moved on to the next cage. And then it was grabbing an archive newspaper and a jar of mustache wax for Earl. He grumbled out a thank you and retreated to a corner of his cell. Fred had made a mess with his meal of human blood. Sighing, I grabbed the mop again. My job, as you can likely tell, is not very exciting. The worst part is the waiting. Every once in a while, the one of my guests tries to escape, and thus I have a loaded assault rifle with anti-personnel rounds next to my small desk that I monitor them from. Oh, my workstation. I don't know why I haven't told you all about it. I have a desk with 14 monitors. The monitors on the bottom show the occupants in their cages. The ones on top have vital readings. If they ever get too low or too high, I'm to press a button to call in special staff to take care of it. Again, I'm not told why they can't, but I assume it's to do with their health. But feeding them raw meat and human blood likely isn't helping matters, and so I'm not entirely sure on that if I'm being perfectly honest with you. The most common breakout is the Marys. To date, 15 Marys have escaped, resulting in 42 casualties. Freds have escaped six times with 20 casualties. One Fred I saw drank a guy's blood like a juice box. His jugular was the straw. The rest have tried as well, but not with the success of Mary and Fred. Except for Lisa, who has never tried. At least not when I've been here. My rifle is a last resort if the security fails, but thankfully, I haven't had to use it. Yet. So while my job's dull, I'm always on edge. Especially as I don't know much about number 8. And the weirdest part is the constant weeping that I hear from number 8's cage. I'm curious about the next occupant of cage 8 if I'm being honest. If there ever is one... I guess we'll find out in three days, huh? Or whenever they move him out. Oh, and I feel I should clarify. They aren't taken out in a certain order. There's always a chance the next one taken will be Fred. 
Or hell, it might be Lisa. The point is, there's no set rotation. They're just taken randomly. Anyway, my next shift is about to start. So I'll have to check in with all of you later. Until next time. Update. Okay, well, I know what I said, but this is some major shit. Lisa is gone. Not broken out, just gone. I was watching the monitors and one second she's there. The next, poof, gone. I put the place on lockdown. I've sounded the alarm. The whole nine yards. I'll keep you guys updated as best I can. Update 2. Well, there are a lot of dead bodies. Good news is I'm still kicking. Bad news, Lisa is still MIA. But the Dow, well, that's in cage 8 now. TD got here an hour ago and I gave him a rundown. He seemed extra freaked out that Lisa had vanished, especially on the same day as number 8's arrival. It's not my job to ask questions, but I'm starting to. I'll keep you guys informed. And so Lisa is still missing. The place is still in lockdown and I haven't been allowed to leave. They're afraid of her getting out. Besides the whole not aging thing and her taste in movies, Lisa always struck me as the least harmful of the bunch. And so I'm pretty worried considering how much they're freaking out about her possible breach. Even Fred's didn't evoke so much panic out of the higher ups. The good news is that I've had some free time to write all of this out. Besides Lisa being missing, I've still been going about the normal routine. Feeding, removing bones from Bill's cage, cleaning up after Fred's feedings. Speaking of which, the new Fred is a particularly messy eater. Or would it be a drinker, considering I'm giving it blood? Cassie seems very aggressive since Lisa's disappearance. She tried more than once to try to bite me. The one that's been worrying me has been Bill. I was feeding him yesterday and saw something moving around inside of his chest as he downed his daily rat. Tomorrow is another move, or it should be at least. I'm not sure what with this security lockdown. And so since I haven't had much to write about in events, I'll take a suggestion to tide you guys over. Some of you guys were curious about the personality of the people in the cages. Well, because I'm a person of the people, I'll tell you about them. Fred is usually very quiet. However, if he misses a scheduled feeding, reminder it's every seven hours, he gets exceptionally aggressive and talkative, making a lot of threats. My personal favorite had to be the time he told me if I was late feeding him again, he would make a smoothie for my tendons. Overall, however, for Fred's, when I have interacted with him outside of a hostile state, and they're very polite and well-spoken. Cassies are less people and more animals. They don't speak much outside of grunts and growls. Personality-wise, they're as deep as a dog bowl. That said, they're also the least hostile of the bunch, outside of feeding time. Probably has something to do with the electrified cage. I even hand-fed one. Well, wearing a thick leather glove, but still. I gave her some of my burger. Let's not tell TD, huh? So, while they look like normal of small women, they don't act like it. Marys are religious knots. They're constantly praying or trying to turn someone to the religion. The current Mary is a pagan. She worships some ancient deity named Hastur. Always asking something about a sign. I don't know. They're interesting, but not much in the way of conversation. I tune them out most of the time. Bobs are mixed, as it is to be expected. Most are very prone to conversation. Typically, it's water cooler talk. You know, what happened at the game, or what happened on Game of Thrones when it was still on. I usually chat with them during my coffee breaks. They're pretty nice guys, really. You know, ignoring the eye thing. But don't let that fool you. 
and they've tried strangling me a few times, and that's why I have the stun gun. Earl is just Earl, not much to say. He always has his nose buried in a newspaper, and so he doesn't talk much. Chad can't speak, due to the whole black substance from every orifice when they speak issue. Before she went missing, Lisa was your typical six-year-old as far as personality is concerned. She even had an imaginary friend. She called him Mr. Abba. Her bear she called Bezel. Interesting names, but hey, she's a weird kid. Or at least she's a strange whatever she is. I have no opinion on Bill, as he's still rather new. Uh, oh shit, TD is getting all of us together for some kind of meeting. I'll update later. Update. Okay, so TD gave us the rundown. When and if we find Lisa, she's to be given restrictions for the time being. Furthermore, we are to never reference her imaginary friend or her teddy bear directly from here on. And as for the doll, it's still in the cage with Bill the last I saw, but nobody else noticed or cared about it, besides me and the caged. Mary in particular holds the doll in reverence it seems. More weirdness from this place I suppose. The security team are still doing a full sweep to find Lisa, but so far no luck. I haven't mentioned the thing moving inside of Bill to TD yet. It seems he has a lot on his plate right now. Never come to your boss with the problem, only solutions. I heard that once in a movie. TD also gave all the people with clearance, i.e. everybody here presently, the files on each captive. I haven't gone over them yet, but I'm certainly intrigued to find out why they've locked all these people away. Update 2 In the middle of that last update, shots were fired. We found Lisa. She was eating a member of security. It was a mess. His limbs were arranged in a heart shape, and she had ripped off his scalp. When they found her, she was dipping his kidneys in ketchup like chicken nuggets. They naturally opened fire. She didn't so much as flinch. The man's intestines were draped around her neck like a scarf, and his scalp was on her head. I nearly vomited when I saw it. I'm a bit fuzzy on the details, but somehow, we managed to secure her and placed her back into her cell. And so that's what she eats as it turns out. The doll was in her cage when she was put back. I didn't mention it to anyone, but the doll, which as I told you, had cat paws in place of hands, well, one hand was now a human one. With a tattoo distinctly similar to the poor bastard Lisa was just eating. I'm going to read those files. I'm done not knowing what I'm doing with. Update 3 Well, I don't know much more than I did previously. I don't know what they did or why they all fit into certain categories. Most of the file is redacted. This feels like a waste of time in all honesty, but it's a start. The only one that wasn't completely redacted was Cassie. And she's human in appearance only. She's some kind of succubus, or a siren, or something, I'm not sure. But she's quite literally a man-eater. The pound of meat isn't any kind of meat. It's human meat. And I still don't know where they go every three days. And why the care instructions are so specific. I'll keep you guys updated. Tomorrow is transfer day. And so I came into work today and TD was in a panic. And why is that? Number 8's skin was found in his cage. Not his body, just his skin. And for the doll, it was still with Lisa in her cage. I wanted to tell him about it, but one thing at a time, you know. And today's transfer day. And in a few hours, one of the cages will be leaving. Who? I have no idea. But some of you suggested I attempt to talk to the current Mary about her religion. Maybe she knows something that we don't. And so that's what I'm going to do. I sat in front of her cage in an old wooden chair. Mary, as usual, was deep in prayer. She spoke some language that I didn't understand. 
I cleared my throat and she looked up. Have you seen the yellow sign? She asked, smiling ear to ear. I shook my head. Why don't you tell me about it? Only pausing for breathing, Mary went into great detail about her patron entity, otherwise known as the King in Yellow, and in some places, simply the Yellow. Hester was a patron of shepherds to some, and to others an unfathomable darkness. I nodded as if understanding, but truthfully, I was more confused than I was previously. Finally, I asked, Why are you here? Why are you in? I pointed to the cage. There. I don't know, she said, her voice faltering for the first time. This Mary was a regular chatterbox and this was the first time that she had fell silent. What about that doll? The one the little girl has? She eyed the doll warily. Lisa was nose deep in her coloring book, but the doll looked right at her. I don't know. I thought at first it to be a vessel of Hester, but... She trailed off. What that crazy nut is saying is that doll is something else. Earl spoke up, for the first time in what seemed like ages. Why are you here then? I asked, turning my attention to the mustachioed man. He shrugged. Jaywalking, he replied, going back to his newspaper. Mary spoke again. The doll. It has a darkness, similar to the king, but not quite, she said. It was as she said this, the doors opened. They wheeled in the new captive. And as they approached Mary's cage, her eyes widened in fear. They shoved me aside roughly and unlocked her cage. They drug Mary out as she dug her nails into the ground with such force that it left a mark in the floor beneath her. They strapped her in, and as she cursed in that unknown language, they wheeled her away. Her replacement, a nun, came soon after. Well, so much for that lead. Security had been on extra high alert since the old man, we're guessing anyway, shed his skin. I was reprimanded by TD for talking to the pagan Mary about her religion. He didn't punish me or anything, but let me off with a warning. She said that the doll had a darkness, and I believed her. I also talked to Lisa for a bit today, asked about Mr. Abba. She said his full name is Don Abba III. Never heard of an imaginary friend having a first and last name. I don't know, I have to focus on the job, and so I'll update you guys later. Update. So I told TD about Lisa's doll. What he said worries me a lot. He said that he didn't see any doll, and that's unnerving. So not only is there possibly a sentient doll, but now I'm the only one who can see it besides the caged. I've conducted interviews with the rest of the caged since Mary's transfer, besides Cassie and Chad, because, well, I can't really speak. Fred was up first. He said he was there for simply being him. This particular Fred was so overweight, he was tired from standing for too long. And so as he sat on the floor of his cage, I finally asked, What do you know about that doll? Gesturing to Lisa's cage. About as much as you do, I suppose. Showed up in her cage one day. Showed up? How did I miss that on the monitors? Yes, sir, the woman. The one that was moved today, well, she wouldn't shut up about it. For a few hours at least. And then she avoided it like it pissed on her shoe or something. He snorted. Where did you come from? Thurman, West Virginia originally. He stated matter-of-factly, moving on. Earl didn't provide much more info than Fred. But what he did tell me caught my ear. 
He claimed to be from Nazareth originally. He also mentioned a woman named Delilah who stabbed him in the back a long time ago. The new Mary was too frightened to be talked to due to these circumstances of her surroundings. And Lisa, well, I'm not talking to her again. It's kind of pointless considering she's technically six. And that just left Bob. Bob, still claiming to be an investment banker from New York, didn't provide much information on the doll. And so I changed the subject. What's with the coins? Oh, these. He pointed to his bloodied socket. They're my lucky coins. Hmm. Yeah, whatever you say, Bob. I returned to my office and I poured a cup of coffee. I nearly had a heart attack when I turned around and saw that freaking doll sitting on my desk. It was not there when I came in. Pinned to his chest was a note scribbled in crayon. It read simply, Look up. I don't know why, but I followed its instruction. On the ceiling, looking down at me was... Me. The person was duct taped to the ceiling. His eyes were gouged out. And carved into his forehead was another message. Stop. I blinked and the corpse and doll were gone. I ran to the monitors and I saw the doll back in Lisa's cage, looking directly at the camera. I'm starting to think this isn't worth $500 a day. I'm sorry about the wait. I've been busy for a few days since Bill slipped out of his skin. Speaking of which, it's still undetermined whether or not Bill could be considered the same being, as whatever had crawled out of his skin. Some of you suggested I tell TD, and I very much intend to. I just have other things to deal with. Also, there were no transfers today, which is weird. Considering it's happened every three days for at least a decade. I've been having trouble sleeping. Every time I shut my eyes, I see that doll. I've even seen it around my house, which is worrying to say the least. I've done more interviews with the inmates. And so, as I can put it together, here's what I've gathered about who or what else these people are. Fred was born, according to him, around 1836. He also claims to have committed several murders since the 1880s. Several victims, including two in the December of 1968. He cites those as his favorites. He's nearly 200 years old, by his own count. Mary claims to be a nun, a woman of the cloth. She said that she was born in 1883 and did what she did for the Lord. And apparently, she had converted the wealthy in order for them to give their money to the church. She also said she's no Catholic, but a Greek Orthodox. Chad, I gave a notebook to communicate with. Below is the said interview. Why are you here? Troubles with women. We've all been there. I followed up by asking. Where were you born? What year? In his response. I was born in Burlington, Vermont, 1946. He certainly didn't look that old. I thanked him for his time and gave him his green liquid, and I moved on. Finally, we have little Lisa. Lisa insistently claims that she was born in 1681 in Massachusetts. She also said that she misses her cousin Betty. That's all I got out of her before she returned her coloring book. It didn't faze me that she's easily the oldest of the bunch. Hold on a second. I just saw something in the camera. It's much bigger than the cages. It's maybe about seven feet tall. It's completely devoid of hair or pigment. What caught my eye, however, was the oxygen tank on its back. I'm looking at number eight. I quickly pressed the alarm button and looked back up at the camera. Its face was right in the camera and it was definitely the face of Bill, grinning ear to rotting ear. Even in the camera, I could tell how decayed its teeth were. 
The feed cut out and then the power. A couple of seconds later, the feed turned back on but the lights didn't. I'm guessing that was an extra security measure. I grabbed the weapon at my station, locked the door, grabbed my security walkie talkie and waited. Weapon aimed at the door. It had to be 4 or maybe 5 hours before TD entered the room. The security team did show up, 2 hours ago in fact, but they had vanished without a trace. Missing? What do you mean? I said feeling sleep deprived, even though I had had plenty of sleep. They arrived on site and they didn't check back in. Sign. I scratched the back of my head. I've had it with this secrecy shit. What are we keeping here? I finally asked as TD studied the monitors. Monsters, he said matter-of-factly. Things that have to be dealt with, by any means necessary. He paused. What's that in Cage 7? The doll? Yes, the doll. Where did it come from? It's been here for a few days now. Since number 8 came in. And why are you telling me this now? He demanded with a look of fear and anger etched across his face. Well, between the... I stopped myself. Since number 7 went missing, and then number 8, I figured it rated low on the list of concerns. He sighed. The power was cut. There's a backup generator. Grab the gun and come with me. My superior ordered me. I guess I don't have much of a choice. I have to stop here for now. Not a good idea to keep writing. What with the lights being out. Update. Alright, I'm still alive. Well, barely. Four of them have broken out. As is the thing I'm assuming at one point was number eight. Mary, Bob, and Chatter all under containment, by their own choice no less. The building is in full lockdown. And he ordered every available security personnel to come immediately. I intended to post this yesterday, but you know, life and death. Monsters wanted to eat my bones. Priorities, you know. TD and I managed to restore power, but I can't leave. Not that I would go out to with those guys out and about. I'm currently in my office with TD, who's watching the monitors. I filled him in on the whole duplicate of me on the ceiling thing, and the doll. His walkie-talkie just sprang to life. I'm not sure, but I believe they said. Cerebus is on site. Doing a full sweep of Sector 6. We'll be at your position in two minutes. TD breathed a sigh of relief. Cerebus, Cerebus, thank God. What's Cerebus? I asked. They're what's gonna get us out of this. He grabbed his walkie. Roger that, Cerebus. We're in security room Foxtrot. Subjects are out of containment with the exceptions of number four, number five, and number six. You have permission to terminate and have the others on site. Also be advised, there may be two hostile entities with a subject seven. Terminate all on site. Roger that. And then there was radio silence. I kind of regret looking over as he grabbed it though, because I realized how tired I am, but I'm not crazy. TD's face wasn't there anymore. It was a mass of flesh and writhing muscles. Two grotesque horns were buried in his forehead. As I blinked, his face had changed to the vaguely aged look I was familiar with. I have to go for now. Cerebus just arrived, but can any of you please tell me? What the hell was I just locked in a room with? You know, if I survive this, I'm asking for a raise. Or actually, a lethal weapon tree, instead of rubber bullets. My job up until last week was watching people in cages. No questions asked. But then cage number 8 arrived, and now... I'm more concerned on getting out of here than performing my job dutifully. Cerebus is still searching for the escaped. We found what was left of the initial security response. They were mauled by something. Limbs thrown all around. 
bite marks, and that sort of thing. If I had to guess, I would say Cassier or Bill got to him. Initially, anyway. The lack of blood suggests Fred as well, but he was never one for dismemberments. Did I mention the initial response was around 10 to 15 guys? It's kind of important. Cerebus, meanwhile, is four men, which was odd in itself. I didn't even know their names. Their faces are completely obscured and they wear riot gear. From what I heard, they go by code names WFP and D. D seems to be the leader of the pack. Despite there only being four of them, TD seems confident they'll round up or exterminate the others. Either way, I'm not sure if I can trust TD anymore. Not after what I saw. I'm not allowed to leave, so in the meantime, I've been piecing together what's actually going on down here, which to be honest isn't going well. I'm still confused as to what these people are. Shit, I just heard gunfire. Update. Alright, well that was something. They found Cassie. She shook off about 30 seconds of shots from assault rifles. She's back in containment, as they could do little more than incapacitate her. One down, I guess. TD has gone missing, though. Cerebus sent F to watch me. I guess they don't trust the normal security guard. They're kind of assholes, in all honesty. I'm really hungry, so I asked F to let me get some food from the cafeteria area, but he denied it with a head shake and pointed to my chair. So I'm just ready now to clear my head. It's getting harder to concentrate if I'm being frank with you guys. I mean, who wouldn't be a little freaked out by this situation? At any rate, what really concerns me is our doll friend has showed up in my office. F doesn't seem to notice or care about it. Maybe TD hadn't briefed these guys. Or maybe I'm finally losing it. God, I'm hungry. You know what's funny? I can't remember anything before last Saturday. The day they added cage number 8. I should have guessed there was something up from the get-go. But the pay was so good and I needed the money. And for 10 years, it was relatively peaceful. Relatively being the operative word. Or was it? I can't be sure anymore. Everything before last Saturday is blank. Stress will do that, I suppose. It's a simple job. Watch people in cages and get paid $500. I need food. I haven't eaten in what feels like days. I'm not dying here. Update. I can't. I can't believe what I did. And so I convinced F to let me go check on the contained subject, feed them, etc. I took my weapon with me just in case, and I was just so hungry. So hungry. And so I ate some of the meat we give to Cassie. Yes, I know it's human, but I needed food, okay? I ate yesterday, but I felt like I was starving. I needed it more than that monster did. And you know the worst part. I like the taste. I mean, it was raw meat, but it wasn't bad. It tasted sort of like pork, and so I ate more. It wasn't until TD appeared out of nowhere that I realized that I had been there for hours, gorging myself. I wasn't hungry anymore, but I couldn't stop myself. TD pulled me away from the flesh feast and told me that they had killed Fred. He didn't seem phased by my actions, instead irritated that I left my post. F wasn't there when I returned, but the doll was. And just like the other day, TD didn't see it, even though he did yesterday. As he turned to leave, I asked, What are you? He stopped. Come again? What are you? He raked his nails on the doorframe as he stood in place. His fingernails bled a bit as he did. I'm just a guy doing his job, the same as you. That didn't satisfy me, so I hit him in the back of the head with my rifle. It didn't even make him flinch. He turned to face me with a look of horrifying calm. You know, I like you. 
a lot more than the previous guard. The grotesque mass of muscle and flesh flashed in my mind, and I fell to the floor. The mask was gone, as whatever this thing was walked towards me. I'm doing a job, doing a job that was given to me, to me, and I need help, I need doing, help it. doing it. All you have to do is freaking watch, watch those monitors, monitors and keep your mouth shut. Your mouth shut. He said, but I heard thousands of voices scream it from within my mind. Do I make myself clear? His voice returned to normal. You're a monster. Oh, look at you. Finally figured that one out, eh? Well, not quite. I'm more like the monster. Lightbringer, Prince of Lies, etc. He said with mocking amusement, gesturing with his hands. Look, I'm not the bad guy here. No, in fact, I'm doing my best to keep them here. And for the sake of mankind, I suggest that you do the same. He patted me on the cheek and left the room. I ran for the door, but it was locked behind him. And so, yeah, I've been working for the devil himself. How fun. I should have suspected that from the beginning, if I'm being honest. I'm going to get some sleep. I'll update you all later. I woke up to more gunfire. They found Earl. His normally short hair was longer now and he had no issues shrugging off bullets. In fact, he broke a gun over his knee. At least that's what I heard over the radio chatter. They had restrained him via horse tranquilizer. I didn't know why they had it either. They cut his hair and then they locked him back up. That explains the hair tonic rule. Lisa and Bill are still missing, but I'm more concerned with getting out of here at this point. I managed to pick the lock. I always keep a bobby pin with me. What can I say? I'm a bit paranoid at this point. And I'm going to lift the lock down at one of the exits. Here's hoping that I make it out. Alright, I figured you guys would like me to keep you updated. I have my phone with me for that very purpose, and if I know this building well, I should be able to find the exit. Cerebus is patrolling for me. At least I think they are. I saw more security staff coming in with equipment. I managed to hide out of sight. My only option is going out the exit they take out the people they take away. I'll update soon. I, I found it, and I wish I hadn't. I really wish I hadn't. The door that they take people out of. There were stairs behind them. The stairs descended far below the building. The smell of sulfur was overpowering, but I decided that it was my only option. I had been spotted by one of Cerebus, so I ran through the door. I still hear them trying to get in. I locked it behind me. The dark pit was seemingly endless, but as I got lower, after hours of walking, I heard it. Screams. Millions upon millions of screams of agony. And the heat. Jesus Christ, the heat. Like the fires of hell. Which, coincidentally, I do believe that's what it was. I tried to turn around, but a grip like a fiery hand grasped my ankle. It tried to pull me down the remainder of the stairs, but I managed to slip away. I ran as fast as I could, back up the stairwell, which they did not come down after all, so I descended for nothing. I went back through and I found the building, seemingly long abandoned. It was the walls were covered in long dried blood, and scorch marks. How the hell? I had come through the right door, hadn't I? I turned to leave, but the door had vanished. I heard a voice behind me. Going somewhere. I turned and saw a TD smiling ear to ear. Come on, follow me. Where are we? Just another one of our locations, with significantly less success. I followed behind him, and I noticed the mask had slipped more. His entire left arm was covered in burn marks and his shirt was torn, revealing two scars on his back. His face was now continually shifting, much more noticeable than ever before. Gone was the aging movie star looks and I just felt pure darkness radiating from him. Think of me as someone who's disciplining some particularly mean children. 
They were naughty and they broke the rules, and so I gave them time out. He said, his voice deepening with every syllable. Oh, and don't think I don't know what you've been doing. You've been breaking the rules yourself, haven't you? Tisk tisk. He snapped his fingers, and we were back in my office, in the normal facility. He finally spoke. We found number seven and number eight. Once we capture them, you're free to leave. You're going to help. I followed TD to a room. On either side, blood and entrails coated the room. Security teams ripped apart. In the center of the carnage was a six-year-old girl and a monstrous creature with an oxygen tank on its back. And then everything went black. My job was I watched people in cages. Seven cages, seven people, each with different rules attached. My boss was a guy named TD. And now there's nine cages. One of them is empty. The ninth cage holds a male occupant. He's about 5'8", and he's to be fed cooked meat and water daily. Furthermore, he's allowed daily internet access for one hour. The cages are a bit cramped, but you get used to it. I used to watch people in cages.